So now we come to Tonka 5. So again, like I said, Tonka 5 covers about the period from Kappa is like 24 to about 31. So um, the first thing that's happening, so if you look at the Tonka image, which will be shown in the video, then from the bottom just to the left of six o'clock, Tsongkhapa is again sitting for one of these monastic debate rounds, this time on the four major treaties. So it's on uh, monastic discipline, Abhidharma or cosmology, uh, Pramana, and I believe the middle way view, although it might be the two Abhidharmas in the middle way view. But anyway, he's sitting monastic in, in his public debate for the final time. Actually, this is the end of that whole period of his life when he's studying and sitting for monastic debates. So this kind of signals the end of his study of sutra, informal studies of sutra. So you'll see there, um, Tsongkhapa, he's the one seated, he has a yellow hat, and then there's some, some uh, monks sitting around, and especially two monks standing and very energetically debating um, against him. Then just after that, at the time he's 25, so again, we're going clockwise around the Tonka, so at about eight o'clock, then Tsongkhapa receives the vows of a fully ordained monk, when he's 25, takes full ordination. Um, then uh, we go a little further around to about nine o'clock, Actually, that's about at about seven o'clock in the Tonka. So then go directly to the, the central image's right. Um, you see Tsongkhapa, he's again wearing the yellow hat. And just to his left, there's a whole stack of texts. So at that time, Tsongkhapa goes to a place called Kisho, which is near Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. Um, and he, he stays at this monastery that has a collection of all the sutras, all the, all the works taught by the Buddha, and all the Indian commentaries that were translated into Tibetan. Well, the Kangyur is the word of the Buddha. The Tengyur is the word of the, of the translated um, commentaries on the Buddha's teachings, right? So, um, so Tsongkhapa stayed there for, I think, a couple of years and, and read the, the entire collection of Buddhist, you know, the, the, word, the actual sutras taught by the Buddha and the Indian commentaries on those in order to get a, an understanding of, you know, the whole breadth and scope of um, Buddha's teachings. And so it said that, um, here, I'll read from the commentary, this, the biography a little bit, um, where it describes that. Mm. He went to Kisho at Tsel, so Tsel is the name of the monastery. He deepened his understanding by reading and reflecting on the holy speech of the Buddha and its Indian, Indian commentaries, which had been translated into Tibetan. Through countless doors of analysis, so using logic and reasoning, the meaning of all the scriptures arose in his mind using as his source all the explanations of Maitreya's clear ornament of realization, you know, the, the commentary on the, um, the, um, the method side of the Perfection of Wisdom Treaties, uh, Sutras, and its commentaries composed in both Indian, India and Tibet, he began writing the, go the Golden Garland of Eloquence. So this, this text that Tsongkhapa, it's the first major treatise Tsongkhapa is going to write in his life. He begins writing it when he's about 26. He only finishes about uh, four years later, when he's 31. So it's called the Golden Golden Garland of Eloquence. It's been translated into English by Gareth Sparham. Um, um, and it's very, it's extremely difficult to read. It's a vast commentary on basically this, this work by Maitreya Buddha, the, the uh, ornament of clear realization. And the, the most important, according to most Tibetans, commentary on that by an Indian, Haribhadra, um, uh, Drawa Donso, which is called like, explanation of the clear meaning, some the clear explanation of the meaning, something like that. But, but Tsongkhapa uniquely, he doesn't rely on any other Tibetan uh, commentary on that work, but rather he relies on the 21 different Indian commentaries on Maitreya's work, or in the clear realization, and he compares all of them. So, I mean, just to fathom like what he's doing there is, is yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to do unless you're really familiar with all those works, but it's like, there's so many different explanations of different passages and lines in that work, and using you know logic and reasoning, he compares all the ones and distinguishes what he thinks are correct from the incorrect explanations, and gives just this incredible, clear uh, uh, commentary on the method side of the Bodhisattva path, and and so that work becomes one of the most published, widely published works in Tibet at that time. Remember, at that time, publication is done by hand, you know, writing things down, copying things down by hand becomes one of the most widely published works at that time and really establishes Tsongkhapa's place from, you know, when he's 30, 30 something years old as one of the greatest scholars that Tibet has ever seen, essentially. Um, so it's interesting to note while, so while, during the four or five years while Tsongkhapa's composing that work on and off, he also goes to, so in this Tanka, 
um, at about 10 o'clock, 10.30, you see this big image of Avalokiteshvara, this white deity with six arms, and in this image has about seven heads. It could be a representation of the thousand-armed, eleven-headed Avalokiteshvara. Anyway, it's this famous Avalokiteshvara statue at, at the Drokhang, the main temple in Lhasa. Tsongkhapa goes there and he engages in yungnes, practicing yungnes, which is this um, practice of, you know, very devotional practice of making prostrations, making prayers, fasting on alternate days. Every other day you don't eat or drink whatsoever. So it's a, it's a practice of voluntarily enduring austerities. And Tsongkhapa does many, um, many of these yungnes in front of this um, um, it's called a, self, a famous statue of Avalokiteshvara at the main temple in, in Lhasa. And it said at that time he analyzed his dreams, probably looking to see like what should he do in the future. Um, and then, so then around the top of this tanka, so, so Kampa, he continues to compose the Golden Garden of Eloquence. He receives more teachings. So some of the main teachings he receives at this point is on the Kala Chakra, the Kala Chakra Tantra, which is considered one of the, the most high, the highest and most complex, most fully developed of the tantras. It doesn't belong to either mother or um, or father tantra. Clearly, it's kind of a very uncommon system of itself among the tantras. What's interesting to note here is that um, Tsongkhapa's main teacher is Rendawa, right? And most of and he's a Sakya in the Sakya lineage. Most of the the prominent lineages of Kala Chakra come from the Jonang lineage, a different lineage in Tibet. His, Tsongkhapa's main teacher, Randawa, thinks that that, Jonan, that Jonangpa lineage of Kala Chakra is not a valid teaching of the Buddha. And so he surely doesn't encourage Tsongkhapa to study it. Maybe even discourages him from studying it, it's not sure. But Tsongkhapa just kind of ignores what his teacher says and goes ahead and studies it anyway, um, on his own. Which is quite interesting, you know, to see that just because our teacher thinks one thing about something doesn't mean we always have to just blindly follow that. But we can think for ourselves and decide what you know where, wh how we want to study how we want to practice so that's happening there and then at this time Tsongkhapa is teaching more and more and more he's become famous through these public debate um, examinations and now he's composed this his 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 uh, this profound treatise a commentary on the method side of the path in the perfection of wisdom sutras and he's teaching more and more and gathering disciples so at one point he's teaching the upper and lower abhidharmas he's teaching the sutra on monastic discipline and he's teaching the middle way to uh, more than 70 um, other scholars, he says. So 70 is considered a lot at that time. Finally, at the end of this tanga, so remember we're going clockwise around, down at about like 5.30, um, you know, think of a clock, you see the image of a deity, um, it's uh, Hiruko Chakra Sambara, and Tsongkhapa is sitting at the feet of that deity, offering a mandala with a white scarf. So this is um, illustrating Tsongkhapa did an intensive meditative retreat on this deity at a place, an area called Oga. Um, and um, um, so in that, that area, Tsongkhapa will do a lot of meditation retreat uh, later on in his life. Um, so during the retreat, also, he practiced the six yogas of Niguma. So that's interesting. It's similar to the six yogas of Naropa, but it's, it's a similar system of tantric practices originated one of the only it said teachings that originated in Tibet and went back to India actually transferred to India so it was uh, developed by this yogini some say is the wife of Naropa or the consort of Naropa but by this um, uh, this woman Nyaguma um, yeah and it's common in the Kagyu I think it's a Kagyu lineage practice so Tsongkhapa practice, did a lot of that kind of um, it's like inner heat sort of meditation every day um, so that concludes the the fifth tongue